It's a great pleasure for me. These beautiful Caribbean nations are going for this first. Yes, this memorandum of understanding that we uh, signed, it will also bring some technical assistance to the Caribbean region. This is a historic moment because here is the first step to turn around. What you're doing today is really important because people like you who have a wonderful following of millions and millions of people and what you're doing with that is so important with saving the soil. If you want to say, I love you to your child, you must just say safe soil because it is a more committed way of saying I love you. It's an extraordinary campaign. It echoes what we in the Commonwealth have been aspiring to do for a number of years. Next hundred days from 21st of March, we want the whole world to talk about soil. It is not about the motorcycle, it's not about the journey, it's not about the song, it is about moving people on the planet. Make it happen, huh? Nobody spoke about soil like I does. I think if we all contribute, then we have a really strong voice. excitement and everybody is so excited to hear Sadhguru. This is our time on the planet. What we do here is our business. Let's do the right things. I honestly didn't feel a part of the movement before, obviously, I'd never met him. Seeing what kind of a following he has and how impactful it is, I really feel like I just joined a global movement. Gravity artists supporting this Safe Soil movement, wanting to inspire the youth, and youth being the major population in most parts of the world today, all graffiti artists, to whatever walls that you have, make sure that you use this. <laughs> beautiful cities of Europe. It really resonated with me, the message that we have to save uh, our soil. It's our common issue together. It's not for one nation, for one person, but uh, we as people have to unite and uh, to solve this. This is a celebration of human beings coming together to do what they need to do. Rishimo Press! All of us have been part of this destruction. The only way is all of us become part of the solution also. Yeah. Riding on to Italy. Italy is raining heavily tonight. Here in Venice. So it's like a, a wave of hope. It's necessary for the future. Over two thousand years ago, this eternal city made the mistake of over-farming the region and that was also the fall of the city at that time. So, the Romans of today should never make that mistake once again. And we are very happy that we are aligned in our message to a really high the profile of soils. Young people getting into farming is very good. That's the future of the world. Thank you.
Here we are in Geneva. I think there, it's a message of urgency, but it's also a message of hope. So I would really like to thank Sadhguru for his leadership. The global movement led by him addresses the soil crisis by mobilizing people around the entire world. This massive fountain in the Lake of Geneva is lit up for Save Soil today. With Save Soil colors of blue and green, you cannot stop this. The moment is on. It's going to be on till the policies are done. In this cold, slippery road and winds are picking up speed, no matter what the hell, I have to keep going. You think this is a problem? Relentless commitment to what you do. That is the only solution. Save soil, let's make it happen. An MOU to be signed between Isha Foundation and 4 per thousand initiative soils for food security and climate. We were just sharing exactly the same objective. Increasing carbon content in the soil. Sadhguru, what you are doing is really impressive. I'm quite amazed and thrilled by it. I was very honored to be on the stage and be able to actually express that, that uh, his mission is uh, what we need. It's fantastic. France has been great. Well, Brussels. We should all stand up and make the most impact we can to create a real change in the world. Save the soil. Get the border! A smashing evening at the <laughs> main event. And a super enthusiastic crowd committing themselves to make this happen. This is heartwarming to see everybody come together. Save soil on the moon. Let's make it happen. Just look up the news and see in the last four months how many governments have started talking about soil because they see it's picking up momentum. But if you create three to four billion people talking about soil, that's it. That will be the main conversation in the government. Save the Soil is a very important movement that we support as UNCCD. We would like to propose to the world to do whatever they can to protect the soil because it is our future. Save soil, let's make it happen. The education ministry in Germany has now come into the picture officially and asked all the children to do artwork to support Save Soil Movement. Good, Arjun. Wonderful. Congratulations that you wrote to the Prime Minister. Let's make it happen! So, on the way to Bratislava, well, the road surface is not great. It's great that all of you are here in Bratislava. Nobody ever imagined hundred years ago that we will have to save soil of all the things. Would you like to come in the kitchen and cook with me a little Why bit? Why not? Without soil being rich, food won't be rich. Without food being rich, our bodies will not be a full potential. What do you call that? <laughs> it's a Sadhguru Sar. <laughs> Table 12. <laughs> the old heroes always built something which stands up like this, but the new heroes are those people who will nurture the soil which always lies beneath our feet, never stands up. <laughs> City of Belgrade, 
the UNFAO said something which really deeply hurt me is the soil that we are consuming right now belongs not even to these little children, belongs to the unborn child. This is an expression of our love and responsibility for our own lives and the future lives. I love the message that he sent and how he like broadened it that it's everybody's responsibility. I think there is a great potential for a good collaboration, partnership with the campaign Save Soil and what we are doing as a government, we can make it together. It's very important bringing a certain sense of love and celebration towards the land that we walk upon. Uh, going from Sofia to Bucharest, not a weather for motorcycle for sure. Organize yourself whichever way you want, form groups, come together somehow and see this happens. Sadhguru reminded me that I have a voice. The people from Istanbul were really amazed by Sadhguru to appear and they were just so happy to see him. This many people, if all of you are committed, and you spend fifteen, twenty minutes a day to enhance the message. I think I don't have to go on writing like crazy. Yesterday I wrote eighteen hours, can you believe this, through Bulgarian roads? It's an honest <laughs> expression of his wisdom and love for humanity, I think. He's been riding through very, uh, you know, rough terrain, rough, rough roads, dusty construction sites. It was a long drive and we were getting a little late for the live event at Tbilisi. He, right at the end, uh, maybe five minutes before the event, uh, decided that he couldn't stop for a break. In the traffic, he was just removing his jacket and gloves and throwing in the car just to make it on time. The whole purpose of this moment is to first to bring this home that when you walk upon the soil, you know it is the source of your life. Keeping it alive is the most important thing. Will you make it happen? from God, for, for the people, for the earth, yes. for the soil. We must save the soil, we must plant the trees, we must replenish the forest, we must save our planet. Wonderful, thank you so much for standing up for soil. Right now, soil has turned into sand because we pulled out all the organic content. We are taking the life out of the soil. If we don't put that back, all the other concerns which are important to be attended to, but none of them will matter. This is not for us, this is for him and his generation hoping that they would have a better future with a better world, safe soil. Here in Palestine, wonderful to be here. I salute you 
and I respect your initiative and my full support of what is needed from the Palestinian side to support you. The most important thing is we must keep our lands alive for future generations because that is a fundamental responsibility we hold for our children and future generations beyond them. a motorcycle driver. I also like motorcycles and it's not easy. The, the, the main, this guy is devoted and this is what makes him so impressive and so he touches people. When it comes to agriculture, when it comes to soil, when it comes to soil ecology, our national borders mean nothing because microorganisms operate as a global system. People are talking about doctors without borders. I'm asking you, are you beings without borders? Are you a life without borders? Dear Sadhguru, one of the world's voices and leaders on soil conservation and land in this day and age, having him and uh, having you here is absolutely fantastic and we welcome you. Implementation has to happen on the land and land is not managed by scientists, land is managed by farmers. So it's extremely important, it must be a single point agenda, incentive-based agenda. If inspiration, incentives and disincentives after a certain period of time is the way forward, this is my appeal to every one of you because I don't want this COP15 to end as one more convention with more paper and more paper. This must end with concrete action and action in such a way that is it's implementable. There is no word to describe what Sadhguru is doing for us. We know how much, you know, you had to do it to get here, you left so many things you were doing with it, but you honored the country, you honored the people of this country. Thank you. And on behalf of the head of state, it's my pleasure. Have, <laughs> I want to thank you very much. It's a great thank privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Same side. Let's make it happen. happen. The Saudi Arabia as a kingdom is since 1970s. Converting deserts into fertile lands has been quietly happening. Other countries which have fertile lands and actively working to turn them into deserts, you must put them to shame, it's very important. In so many ways we have found uh, the differences between each other in terms of nationality, race, religion, caste, creed. If we act as one humanity, in the next ten, fifteen years, we can turn this around. Yeah. We are very glad to have uh, Sadhguru in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Right now, this is not even about generosity, this is about survival. It's an honor to have you here in this location, in the heart of Bahrain, in this ancient harbor. We are very proud that you're here today, discovering the layers of history in this beautiful place. You know, the most important thing of what I have learned from him is that the most important thing is to live in harmony and peace within yourself. Forty minutes past uh, midnight, just another maybe thirty kilometers to the Emirates border, UAE border. It's been a long drive. Totally 930 kilometers today we are doing.
while the uh, UAE has become, you know, an airline hub and a shopping hub and other kinds, but nobody imagined it could be an ecological hub. Thank you so much for being here with us, Sadhguru, on this, on this wonderful journey. The UAE is partnering with you on safe soil, such an important cause. Safe soil is surely a cause that we can all fully endorse. My dear brother Sadhguru, I would like to thank you for including the United Arab Emirates in your inspiring journey. I'm proud to share that the UAE is working hard to include soil management and national strategies and policies. Save the soil is one of the most important things on the planet right now. It's not his mission, it needs to become all of our missions. I'm here to save soil. I had a meeting with uh, Sadhguruji somewhere in uh, December, I believe. And uh, the net outcome of that whole thing is that I have earmarked funds to make good of the eco deficit of that particular year. Economy should also go grow, but it should have a ecological responsibility in its growth. Right now, everybody is talking about robotics. It's time robotics goes into agriculture. Right now you have a big machine which just rips the soil off. This, if you leave the robotic machines through the day and night where just as much as needed, they can do. They don't have to rip the whole soil. Yes, science is already there, we know what to do. It is just that industry is not caught up because in the policy those things have not come. I said, oh man, one more desert I have to ride. I said, no Sadhguru, Oman looks like Kerala. <laughs> if one part of your nation is green, it just takes a determined effort to stretch that green all the way up. to describe what it means to be back in India. Seventy days we've been on the road, seventy-four nations have signed up. It's a very proud moment to have amidst us the saviour of the soil. It's my fortune that the first step that I take in the sacred land of birth is in Jamnagar.
પેલી માટી અને પશુ એટલે કે બીજા જીવ મનુષ્ય સિવાયના જીવ એ બંનેની જાળવણી જો કરીશું તો જ મનુષ્ય બચી શકાય એવું છે લીડ લઈશું ગુજરાત તમને એટલું કહી શકાય કે લીડ લઈને ગુજરાત આની મેં જેટલું બને એટલું ઝડપથી You are in Gujarat since two days. So, how did Gujarat feel about you? People are cool, but the weather is hot. <laughs> <laughs> Will you promise me in the next hundred years time, we'll make the weather also cool for future generations? I was really happy to interact with Sadhguruji. It really uh, inspired me. to work more and more towards this country this nation this soil philanthropist educational sports person business leader and six time guinness world record holder including record set in 2020 when go green initiative called vikshahi jeevan abhiyan was launched it witnessed the greatest number of people potting plants at udaipur 4035 saplings were potted in less than 1 minute setting a new world record maharaja kumar sahib lakshraj singh ji mewar of udaipur has since an early age voluntarily and consciously dedicated himself to public upholding the cause of righteousness sadguru the founder of isha foundation conscious planet and safe cell movement started his solo motorbike journey from london on 21st march which will take him 30 kilo 30000 kilometers across 27 countries from the uk to the middle east and then to india and now it is my honor to invite maharaja kumar sahib lakshraj singh ji and sadguru to please come on stage
Namaskaram. To every one of you, Namaskaram. So, please. I really don't know where to begin. <laughs> but first and foremost, I think uh, the people of Udaipur, we are all absolutely honored to have you in Udaipur. Thank you so much for coming here, stopping by, spreading the message that you are. The one thing that I would like to mention from this hall, that this hall has witnessed a lot of history. The Treaty of Accession, signing of the Independent of India took place within this hall. Mm -hmm. Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam conducted some of his most important conferences in nuclear development of this nation in this hall. And today, in the same breath, we have the honor of having Sadhguru amongst us. So thank you once again. Now I must say, I, th I don't think in my own house I have been ever so comfortable and luxurious that we've seen such so far. So thank you to you that we've been able to get such good treatment. Don't believe him. No. <laughs> He's trying to fix the staff. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. But 30,000 kilometers, talking about the soil, I don't think any of us would have thought this till this man would have done this, brought this to the attention of more than half of the population of this universe, I think something that is absolutely commendable. But I will still go ahead and ask you, how can the world contribute today? In, in a layman's language, we will still begin with the soil. How can the world contribute to save the soil campaign? And tell us why we should save the soil. <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> why we should uh, save the soil, I'll address that first. See, every soil scientist in the world knows, I am not a soil scientist, I am not an ecologist, I am not even an activist, I am just a worm. I've crawled on this planet for six and a half decades. In my perception, after being in conversation with various agronomists, top soil scientists, UN agencies, scientific bodies in the world, a worm always knows more about the soil than anybody else because everything that happens to the soil happens to him. It doesn't happen to the scientists. It may happen to the farmer to some extent. But everything that happens to the soil happens to the worm immediately. That's me. I'm… I'm somebody who's never been interested in anything academic. I went to school only when it was a must. Three years of my graduation, I mostly spent time under a tree in the garden. Didn't sit in a classroom. So what is my qualification? Because some people have asked, what is your qualification? We have misunderstood our criminally replaced information instead of human attention. It's your attention which can open up just about anything in the universe. Human attention, if it's keen enough, if it is intense enough, it can open any door in the universe. But in the name of formal education, we are trying to replace human attention with heaps of information. I have not seen your Wikipedia page. I don't have information about you, but I see you. I see things in you that you would have not seen yourself because I pay attention. If I go by the 
whether this page or that page or whatever information that is there, that may tell you something about what you have done till now. It will not tell me what you could do tomorrow. So this is the important thing about soil. Unfortunately, in the last two and a half years it's been shocking for me as I speak to various agricultural ministries across the world, eighty-five percent of the nations still address soil as an inert substance. It's an inert substance that you could fix by adding or discounting a chemical. Add nitrogen or add a phosphate or add a sulfate, it'll be fixed. Well, soil is the largest living system, not just on this planet, in the universe. The known universe that we know, there isn't another thing like topsoil of this planet. Because even if you sow death, it bursts out light, life. Such a magical material, which is the mother of our mothers, we are treating it as a resource. Every one of us, how fed upon our mother's brass, will we call her a resource? Or is she the source of our life? The moment you call her resource, you have lost your humanity. Fundamental basic humanity you lost. I don't think even animals do that. Animals which have suckled upon the breasts of their mothers, I don't think even they think like that, that she's a resource. But unfortunately, our ideas of education, our ideas of science, our ideas of civilization is, we think and address our mothers as resource. So, last thirty years I've been talking about it, uh, some activists, I usually call them idiots, but I'm being respectful, <laughs> activists. They are asking, oh, he was talking about trees, suddenly he changed the subject to rivers, now he's changed the subject to soil, new fashion, is it? <laughs> Are they idiot? When I talked about trees, was I planting it on my head? Where was I planting the trees? Please, hello? If you have ever planted a tree, where did you plant it? In the sky? In the soil. In a tropical country, if a river is flowing or not flowing, both are determined by the soil upon which it flows, because here there is no melting ice coming. Uh, the problem is, these are all worms which fell out of a book. I am a worm which crawled on this planet, that's the important difference. <laughs> so, as I go about meeting people in the last few years, talking to them extensively, I realized everybody in responsible positions, all of them know the problem, how serious it is, and generally know the direction of the solution. And I thought everybody knows the problem, everybody knows the solution. Uh, the simple thing is, they're just waiting for an idiot to bell the cat. So here I am. You know, in Rajasthan, who should bell the wild camel? The village idiot, of course. Hello? Uh, because if he, if he gets kicked in the face, he's all right. So this has been the unfortunate reality of this world. As you know, major conventions have happened in the last two, three years with big fanfare, spending millions of dollars and big talk about things. Whole worlds, all nations assembling in one place. What is the issue? I don't want to get into the politics of it because I'm aiming for four billion people, they could be that number two. So I don't want to enter the politics, but all of you people who call yourself intelligent, educated people must find out why the hell nobody was talking about soil and suddenly everybody is saying, yes, yes, soil is a big problem. Why nobody was talking about soil? There is a reason you find out, we'll leave that aside. 
The important thing is now, what can we do means just this. See, if you roll up your sleeves, you may have a few hundred acres around this palace. If you fix that, it's wonderful for you. All these people may have home, big homes, small homes, kitchen gardens, big fields, whatever they may have. If you fix all that, it's very cute of you, but it's not a solution, I want you to know that. That time is past where I could fix my land, you fix your land, that's a solution. That time passed somewhere in seventies, early seventies that time passed. Now, if there is no full-scale policy on the global level to address soil ecology in the next twenty-five to forty years' time, here these young girls are sitting here and there are some children, you have dismantled the foundations of possible good life for them. Just know this, this is a crime that you will have to bear. This is not… I am not an doomsday sayer, I am a very super positive person. I am saying this because this is a fact which will tumble down upon us. But the problem with humanity many, many times has been, as people being in Rajasthan, I don't want to go into your history, but you must also look at it. Any number of times when disasters were coming, people slept, thinking, if I sleep, it'll go away. For that, as a region, as a nation, we have paid an enormous price. We may be very happy, seventy-five years of independence this year, and clapping our hands and beating the drum, wonderful, it's a very important thing now that it's hap happened. But first of all, a, a nation, a land which has been here before others had anything to do in their life, when others were still on the trees, we had everything, all right? Hello? When most cultures were still hanging from the trees, we had everything, and how come? A few hundred people can come and take, take this whole bloody land, not one piece, from top to toe, toe, all right? How come such a thing can happen? Because we have this problem, we will sleep. I'm sorry, is sleep a crime? Hello? Is sleep a crime? No. But if you sleep through your life, you will be a disaster. And a disaster is always worse than a crime. Crime affects one or two people, disaster means it takes away generations of people. So, this habit of walking into disasters and then grieving over it and writing poetry about it, making romanticizing our own suffering, God damn it, stop it. This one disaster if you walk into, you will not walk out of it. This is why we need to act. What should I do? What should I do? You're now living in a democratic nation. The most important thing in these nations is to raise your voice. Oh, I tweeted yesterday, I'm done. No, that's not the thing. I want you to understand this. It is a… because I'm saying it is a fetish in this country to constantly give commentary on the political leaders of this nation. I'm not saying they're per perfect people. They have their issues, they have their problems, like everybody on the street has their problems. They have the same problems sitting in high places, unfortunately. But if you were the chief minister or prime minister or anything of power, and I give you five-year term, tell me, would you… Of course, in any given country or state, resource is always scarce. If you do this, you can't do that. It's always the case. When this is the case, would you attempt to do something which will produce results in five years, so they will once again elect you? Or would you try to do something which will produce results after fifteen, twenty years? Please tell me honestly. Yes, that's exactly being done. Nobody wants to even talk about soil, because if you talk about it, you have to work for it, you have to invest in it, you have to keep your energies on it, 
but it'll take 15, 20 years. When most politicians get into power, when they're after 60, 65 years of age, how do you expect them to focus on something which will take 15, 20 years to bear result if you don't stand up and give a strong mandate that if you do something long term, we're with you. Not just you, I'm telling you, not in a single nation, not in a single nation in the entire world, 60% of the adult population has stood up and ever said, we are concerned about the long-term well-being of our country, we are concerned about the future of our children, what are you doing about it? No, they want one percent tax rebate, they want two rupees deduction in their petrol price, they goddamn it getting it. These are, these are beggars, these are not democratic uh, citizens. When we say democracy in South, the word for democracy is jananayakam, that means people are the leaders, that's what democracy means. These are not nation's leaders. These are people who sit in a tea shop and comment about everything, no responsibility about anything. And I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking to you like this, but I'm telling you, if we don't wake up now, especially in this country, with 1.3 billion people, our organic content, average our organic content is 0 0.68. Uh, this is a desert. Oh, you've gotten used to the desert. Don't worry about Rajasthan, fly from Delhi to Chennai, every five minutes look out of the window, the whole damn country is a desert. Except Western Ghats and Northeastern part of the country, the whole country looks like a brown desert. Please fly and see. Have you seen or no, many of you? What is it that we're waiting for? The problem with Aziz, we've forgotten just seventy, seventy-five years ago, we used to have terrible famines in this country. Hmm? Do you… do you… have you at least read about it, young people? There were famines in this country. Famine is not a joke. Famine is the worst way for a human being to die. If there is a war, at least somebody… the swords around, so I won't talk about guns. Somebody will at least take off your head, which is a useless head anyway. Famine means three to four months you die slowly. It is the worst, most inhuman way for a human being to die. As this begins to happen, initially you lose your civilizational pretensions, then you lose your pretension of even being human. There have been hundreds of situations around the world during famine times, parents have cut off the limbs of their own children and eaten it because they don't want to kill the children, but they want to survive. If you do something like that in your life, after that can you live, I'm asking you. Hello? If you're forced to do something like that, after that can you live as a human being? I'm saying we're… after all this organization, technology, development, as a world, not just as a nation, as a world, we are driving towards a famine, a serious famine. So already, if you are very innocent, actually innocent is not the word, there's a bad word for that, but I'll use nice words because I'm your guest today, you know. If you are very innocent, you do not know what is happening in geopolitics, all the people who have big guns are already positioning themselves to have the more for most fertile lands in the world. You think you can do it? Hello? You think with this sword you can go and take the most fertile lands in the world and keep it for Indians or at least Rajasthanis? You think you can do it? You think you are anywhere in that position, I'm asking you? We are not there. We will not be there and they will never allow us to be there unless in our land we keep it strong and healthy. At least we can protect what is ours, because when food shortages come, whoever has the biggest guns will take it. Have no doubt about it. Have absolutely no… I know I'm trying to paint a hard, uh, uh, terrible picture, this is not my picture, UNFAO is saying this, UNCCD is saying this, major organizations in the world are talking about by 2035, there will be dozens of civil wars across the world. I want you to imagine in this city, 
if forty percent of the people have not eaten for three days, what do you think will happen? They'll just sit in a corner and die, is it? Or they will rip you up on the street. Hello? So this is what will happen to the world and this is what we are driving towards. It is not too far away. Right now, on an average, per year, every year, twenty-seven thousand species – yes, you heard it right – twenty-seven thousand species of organisms are going extinct per year. At this rate, every calculation shows somewhere between twenty-five to forty years, there will be a collapse. It is right now a slide. When a certain number of biodiversity, a certain amount of biodiversity is lost, there will be a tumble. When the tumble begins, there is nothing you and me can do. We just have to learn somewhere in the mountain one small patch of land so that I can eat and survive, hiding from everybody else and hiding the food and me just eating without bothering about what's happening to you. That is the kind of filthy life we'll have to live because human beings want to survive. It's natural, individual human beings want to survive. If we don't want to drive there, we are in a privileged position as a generation. We have a great challenge, but we have a privileged position because we are in a cusp of time that if we act now with the right policies, Within the next ten to fifteen years' time, we can make a significant turnaround. There's enough science and data to point this out. I don't want to go into all that. Those of you who have a heart for life, your own life, not my life. My life, you live it. I've lived it. It can go. Your own life, your children's life, if you have a heart for this, please just do some research for yourself. Look up UNFAO sites. Look up the soil sciences sites. If that is all too technical and complex for you, just look up safe soil site. It is put in a much simpler terms. Please look it up, educate yourself and you must start your own safe soil movement. This is not about me. This is not about what I speak, what I do. After thirty years of non-stop talking about it, then I see everybody just sleeps on it. I thought I should do something. What can I do? I don't hold an office. I am not this minister or that minister. The only thing that I can do is I can stick my life out. Fortunately, people across the world have responded. But uh, we must drive this towards solution. Seventy-four nations have signed up. But if people don't keep their voice up, tell me, as you already said, even if you were the leader, you would only focus on short term. And the history of this nation has been, whenever a leader took long term steps, the next election he lost for sure. That shows who we are. Hello? It's happened, isn't it? So this is important as responsible citizens that you keep the voice up. Till when, Sadhguru, how to keep my voice up? Are, aren't you selling silly messages on your smartphone? Hello? For this is the first time in the history of humanity, you have a tool in your very pocket that if you want you can sit here and reach the entire world. Many great beings have come in this land and in many places, but when they spoke, hardly ten people could hear. Here you are, sitting in the comfort of your home, you can talk to the world. I'm telling you, if you're really committed, just you, one person I'm talking, just one of you, in the next six months can reach the entire world. Everybody who has, has a similar companion like you. No, I'm not talking about your husband or wife, I'm talking about the smart companion that you have. Hello? Is your phone going to be always smarter than you? This you must decide. Hello? You must be smarter than the phone, isn't it so? Hello? I'm… I'm sorry I'm speaking in this tone because the nation has this problem of slumber. We think if we sleep, problem will go away. 
Yes, it will go away. If our life goes away, all problems go away. People ask, first thing they ask, Sadhguru, what do you predict, Sadhguru, will the world end? Sir, if the world ends, no problem at all. All problems will end. The problem is, it'll be a slow fade. Question is, who will get hit first, that's all. But nobody will be spared. One way or the other, once there are food shortages, rich and poor will suffer equally, in different ways maybe. Maybe poor are spared because they will die quickly. Others who have access to food will take a long time to die. Above all, everything we have built in the last hundred years, we will destroy. That is the important thing. It's not happened easy. Hello? Whether it's getting independence for this nation or building this nation towards what it is right now, it's not been easy. It's a toil. Enormous sacrifice behind this. All that will be simply wasted because we cannot even tweet. It takes a bird brain to tweet. It doesn't take a full human brain to do it. Please, I'm sorry. <laughs> Talking about uh, survival and what you mentioned, the last two years, not only for our... not only for our nation, but for the entire world have been catastrophic. We've seen so much destruction, we've seen so much death. What is it that the human race at large, beyond geographical boundaries, can do to rise above all of this, to live life as it should be from either mental issues that people have been suffering, psychological issues that people have been suffering, pain that people have been suffering. What is it that the human race can do to deal with the situation of the now better? Obviously, you're talking about Miss Corona. Yes. Oh. No offense to ladies, I just thought if I say Mr. then they'll ask why is it a man? So I. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's unfortunate uh, that over six million people have died. Now recently, WHO says, no, it was not six, it is 14.9 million, maybe. One simple thing we need to understand is, the nutritional value in the food in the last hundred years has dropped nearly ninety percent. You know, the video was talking about it, we'll leave that. Are there any medical doctors here? Yeah. See, it doesn't take a, a top-level virologist. Anybody, simple medical doctor also, knows this much, that if you don't have certain nourishment of vitamin A, vitamin B6, B12, C, calcium, iron, foliate, magnesium, copper, zinc in your diet, in your micronutrients that you need, you become susceptible to upper respiratory, respiratory tract infections. This is common knowledge. You can give it whatever name you want and you can market it whichever way you want. I'm consciously using the word market. Essentially, it is a respiratory tract infection. Why should fifteen million people die for respiratory tract infection if they were properly nourished? Why are they not nourished? Soil doesn't have it. Where will it come from? So, richer nations, they have huge pharmacies which are selling them complex micronutrients. I was driving in Los Angeles before this, starting this journey, I had to just look up a fifteen-floor building, full-sized full hoarding of fifteen-floor building size. The only words on it is, my favorite pharmacy. I thought, oh, when did a pharmacy become a favorite place to go to? Next thing is my favorite hospital, next thing is my favorite cemetery. Cemetery, hospital, pharmacy, these are things you go to when it's inevitable. Hello? 
These are not favorite places to go to, this is not a restaurant. <laughs> but my favorite pharmacy, that is because they are not selling prescription medication. They are selling a complex cocktail of micronutrients in California. California has an economy larger than India as a nation, one state. It's huge in terms of economy. That means generally everybody is well above well to do, largely. But here, their nutrition is so poor. If that is their case, what is the case here, what is the case in the rest of the world, you can imagine. We don't know the numbers here because there are no studies, there are no reports like that. But if this is the case with California, they need a favorite pharmacy, what is the situation everywhere else? So the pandemic spread the way that spread. One thing is irresponsible response to it, or they don't know what is response, only compulsive reactions to it. When the first it began, in these two years, I have been far more active than before, simply because roads are clear, every, everywhere there's more space. And I traveled through these two years doing a whole lot of work. Till now, it's not that I'm some kind of a super being who dropped from somewhere, I'm a normal human being. And uh, I have not caught the infection. And will people maintain distance? No, they will jump on me, they will hug me without my permission, they'll come and speak to me in my face. Yes, but still I have not caught the infection. There must be some reason, isn't it? Little care about how we live. So am I getting some super food from somewhere? Am I… Uh, there are people in Europe and all taking all kinds of monthly injections which are supposed to have <laughs> some <laughs> whatever stem cells, this, that. Do I have any treatments like that? No, I'm eating simple South Indian diet whenever I get it. Because in my life, food and sleep never comes on time <laughs> So, I want you to understand this pandemic, unfortunately it took that many lives, but is it not important that we look why a simple respiratory infection takes this many lives? Why is it? No, we don't want to look at it because that's not good business. If you are healthy, it's not good business for me. Because we are economy driven. Everything should be good for the economy, not for the people. So because of this, we are doing many blunders. And about people crying about pandemic, this happened, that happened. They're locked up in their homes. They were always complaining going to work. Staying at home, they discovered is more difficult than going to work <laughs> I know there is discomfort, there is children, there is works. Yeah, simple solutions for it. I, I don't want to insult them by giving simple solutions. It's very simple, you could have just gone somewhere, built one hut and lived somewhere in one village. Hello? I would have given you land if you wanted. If you say, I'll build a hut, and work in the ashram, I would give you food and allow you to live. Happily, we would have become very healthy, super healthy and strong in two years' time. No, no, you won't do anything like that because you're enslaved to your lifestyle. Not life, lifestyle. This is an important thing we need to understand. If your commitment is to your lifestyle, you're already messed up. Your commitment is to this life and every life. Life is important. Lifestyle is not important, living in style is important, but not lifestyle. Lifestyle means knickknacks you have. <laughs> so except for those fifteen million or six million or whatever number because it's being big debated, official number is six million, six million people who unfortunately passed. Uh, one of my cousin brothers who was one year younger to me, a very mm, well-known scientist, he passed away. Mm. Almost everybody around me lost somebody who's dear to them, all right? In some terrible conditions because they could not see the bodies, bodies were straight 
taken away. This is… you know, there's no closure in their mind, so they struggle. I… I sympathize with that. But for the rest of the people who are exaggerating their suffering, is just that they sat at home and got big. That's all most people did. They could have done many things, they got a baka. I… when the pandemic came, people asked, Sadhguru, what to do? I was holding daily satsang. I said, just set this up. In these two months, at that time the lockdown was supposed to be six weeks or something. I said, in the six weeks, fix it. At least you will be ten percent physically fitter, mentally sharper, and whatever the job that you're doing, you'll be ten percent better. Aim at this. Lockdown is a good time to do this. When do you get a time like that? Hello? Whenever do you get a time like that? You don't know. I had never ever painted in my life. I'm not an artistic kind. I've not had the attention nor the time to do such things. Pandemic came and I became a painter. I sold two paintings for 1.4 million dollars and funded our COVID activity in the local area <laughs> I'm saying there were so many things you could do. Very poor people, unfortunately no jobs, livelihood issues, that's a different matter. That's a life issue. For the rest of the people, it's just a lifestyle issue. Oh, I couldn't have my hair cut. Even I didn't have for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying we are fussing about small things too much. It's time you understand the only precious thing, the only thing, why precious? The only thing that you have is life. If you're not understanding what I'm saying, have you attended a funeral any time, any of you? All of you? Attended at least one funeral in your life? So if you go to the funeral, this man is like this. Always in proper position he is. He's never like that, all right? He's like this. You go and say sweetest things to him. You tell him, I'm giving you a billion dollars. You tell him, I found a mountain of gold for you. The guy is not interested in anything. Hello? Have you tried it? You must try. Because once life is taken out of this, all the rest of the nonsense you're thinking that's valuable doesn't mean a damn thing. As long as this is on, you shouldn't have a single complaint. Hello? Hello? If you don't get your dinner tonight, oh, you're dieting, of course. <laughs> Sir, I'm sorry. <laughs> One's just lost in listening and I think there's something more coming, so that's why I just keep waiting. <laughs> I can, but uh, I think they must also digest now. <laughs> I think uh, the fact that people have asked you so many questions and, and you being the one who's been answering so many questions, the one thing that comes to my mind is that what is that one question that remains constant but the answers keep changing and what is it that you would explain to people or tell people through that one question that is a constant but your answers have always changed? <laughs> uh, one… Uh, <coughs> <coughs> I'm so sorry. I still got desert stand, sand in my lungs, but I'm in one more desert again, look at my fate. I could have uh, landed my boat in Karnataka and done my motorcycling through the greenest part of the country, through Western Ghat and slowly in the end come towards Rajasthan, but I chose to land in Gujarat and here I am, once again in a desert. I thought, let me be done with all the deserts <laughs> So one uh, constant question is always, it is… it comes in different forms, but essentially they want to know uh, <laughs> how they can be happy because their idea of happiness 
is they must get that, that, that and that and one that, okay? Because this, this, this is this all trinkets, they also know, just to make themselves look profound, they also want God or heaven or something, little. If they start with that, then I may say, then go there. <laughs> so they start with all these things. <laughs> Why you want all this? Because I want to be happy. So essentially, what is the way that I fulfill everything and be happy? So we can answer this in many ways. The fundamental thing is, you will never fulfill these things because before you fulfill this, the next one is always ready. Hello? It's the nature of the desire is, by the time you fulfill this, the next one is always ready, isn't it? Did it ever get over, I'm asking? Only the day you are feeling really sick, say, Shiva, I don't want anything, Shiva, if I can just… <laughs> Tomorrow morning, little energy coursing, cour coursing through your body, hmm, once again ready <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Only sick people, those who are on the deathbed, they are desireless. But they have only one desire to get healthy and live forever. <laughs> so this silly thing is always going on in the human mind. Why is it such a simple thing as somebody wants to be happy? Why is it so complicated? All of you remember when you were three, four, five, six years of age, you were bubbling with joy. Somebody had to make you unhappy. Now, by the time you are thirty, now somebody has to make you happy <laughs> What happened? Why did the equation get reversed? No, I've grown up. Are you at five if you were so joyful and if you grew up by the time you're thirty, you should be ecstatic. If you really grew up, see, if you found a mango tree which is this tall and had one fruit, when it becomes that big tree, it must have at least hundred fruits. No, nothing, not even a flower, not a leaf. This means you're sick. Hello? <clears throat> So, why this has happened is, this is the case of a potato farmer. You heard of him? You don't grow potatoes in Rajasthan? No, no, I understand. Understand. A potato farmer wanted to eat mangoes. He had the intelligence to go to the right tree. Which tree? Hey, you can't tell a story to people who are like, like this. Which tree? Mango tree he went. He had smart enough to go to the mango tree. He didn't go to the coconut tree and say, mango, mango. He's not that stupid. He knows he should go to the mango tree. He went to the mango tree. But out of sheer habit, started digging the ground looking for mangoes because he's a potato farmer. When he did not find any mangoes, he became furious, dug furiously. As he dug more and more furiously, slowly the tree came down upon him. This is the story of humanity. Even right now, even the soil crisis, the soil crisis is just this. There is no one evil force sitting somewhere and planning how to destroy this planet. There is no such thing. Though some activists think it's like that, some juvenile activists are going about saying, oh, you did it, she did it, he did it. Uh, it's not like that. It's just human beings in pursuit of their happiness and well-being, they're digging the planet upside down. Not by evil forces, every one of us are partners in this destruction, yes or no, knowingly or unknowingly. 
Uh, the only way to turn it around is every one of us are partners in the solution also. Now, this longing to be happy is not a philosophy, not an ideology, not a religious teaching. It's an intrinsic longing that you want to live well. What is living well? You want to be pleasant. You want your life to be pleasant? Yes or no? I'll bless you every time I ask you a question, whether you say yes, no or silence, accordingly I'll bless you. It's up to you. <laughs> Don't take this lightly. <laughs> what is the pleasantness that you want? You want body to be pleasant because pleasantness of the body means this is healthy. You want healthy… to be healthy. Those who think, ah, what about it? Then you don't know. The day you become unhealthy, what happens to you, you do not know. The joy of being healthy, once you lose it, ah. You've seen unhealthy people for some reason, some ailment they got? What's the level of suffering that they're going through, sitting, standing? You want health? Yes. <laughs> if it… if the body becomes very pleasant, we call this pleasure. I'm not asking you, I know you want that. <laughs> if the mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this joy. If our emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this compassion. If our very life energies become pleasant, we call this bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If our surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Only to create pleasantness of our surroundings, you need resources, means, support, skills, cooperation of various forces around you. But to create present pleasantness of body, pleasantness of mind, pleasantness of emotion and pleasantness of energy is one hundred percent your business. I didn't hear a single yes. Surroundings, it is a question of times in which we are where we are. It's not all us. Hello? It's not all made by me or you. What is around is made by the times in which we exist. But what is within must be hundred percent ours, isn't it? If you had taken charge of this, the previous question that was asked, would it mean anything? Pandemic is on, but you are healthy, your body is very pleasurable, simply the way it is. It's a great pleasure to live in this body. You're joyful, you're blissful, you're loving. Do you have any problem? Situation, there's a problem, we will do our best, whatever we can do. Every human being can only do the best they can do. Now, when you yourself are not pleasant within you, you will not even do what you can do. This is the fate of ninety-five percent of humanity on the planet. Most of them in their life, they will not do what they can do. In our lives, if we do not do what we cannot do, there is no problem. But in our lives, if we do not do what we can do, we are a disaster, isn't it? Yes or no? What we cannot do, leave it, that's the way it is. What we can do must happen, but when you are a big issue by your own nature, your own body, your own mind, your own emotions keep you busy because you are an issue, what other issue will you handle? 
what else can you do? Because managing your silly emotion is a whole lifetime. If you are thirty, forty, fifty years of age and you still don't know how to use your thought and emotion for your well-being, that means you're a cripple, isn't it? Hello? If you're thirty years of age and you don't know how to use your hands, okay, you are disabled. If you don't get it, I will call you a cripple. If you do not know how to use your thought, Every day, wherever you sit, it pokes you, pokes you, pokes you, pokes you. Suppose your hand is like this, if it sits here, it goes and pokes your eye all the time. You have a serious problem or no? So just because you do it with your thought and emotion, you think you don't have a problem? You're a serious case. Your only comfort is everybody around you is in the same condition. But that's how it is in a mental asylum. <laughs> Only a doctor looks crazy. <laughs> this happened. Can I tell you a joke because you're becoming serious? Because seriousness is the main reason why human beings have become like this. People have always been asking you to be serious. For everything, these days young people are using the word seriously all the time. I was driving <laughs> I was driving in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire, this is the first time I am there in Africa, in that country, right. this small little country in West Africa for the COP15. I had to go to some other embassy to get some visa or something. So I am driving. Like I found that everybody on the street knows me, Taxi drivers know me, security people know me. I couldn't believe this in Africa, this is the first time I'm going and that too, it's a French-speaking country, not a, so much an English-speaking country. Then a uh, car is going slowly through a narrow street. One guy is sitting on the floor, on the pavement. You know that kind of man who is drunk at uh, ten o'clock in the morning? <laughs> you have them too <laughs> And uh, he's just sitting there like this. And he says, Seriously, Sadhguru? <laughs> I said, Oh my God. <laughs> I thought, I said, Hey man, you and me are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, both are drunk all the time, so. <laughs> so, seriousness has happened because we have lost context of our life. We have lost context of our life. The first chant that we did is just about this. As you sit here, since you came and sat here, you are one hour forty-five minutes closer to your grave. Hello? This is not my curse, it's happening, all right? If you do some yoga, inner engineering, you can learn to kick the can a little bit. But even if you do inner engineering, you'll die, I assure you. Little later, that's all <laughs> Is that okay? Hello? Because uh, there is a thing in this country, if you go to a yogi or a sage or a saint, he will bless you for always, you will live or forever you will live some nonsense. No, you will die and it's a very good thing you will die, otherwise how will the world bear with you if you live forever? When our time comes, we must go, we must live a full life, of course. I bless you with a long life, but when it's time, you must die, isn't it so? Hello? Why I'm saying such simple stupid things to you is, such stupid things have not gotten into people's heads. This is why I said, I'm a worm crawling on this planet because I understand how life happens. Others are all living in heaven, Lala. They got the fancy ideas. This is why life is such a big problem, just to be happy. To do things in the world, there are many challenges. To sit here peacefully and joyfully is such a problem means you are not even in the square one of your life. When you are five years of age, you are doing better. By the time you are thirty, you are such a miserable nonsense. Why? You must look at it. Hello? 
This is not a joke. No, because my husband, you know, like this, my wife, you know. Are move away. I'm saying we opened an ashram for you only. <laughs> but if you can't be joyful with two people, you think in the ashram with five thousand people, you will be, you'll be crushed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I'm telling you. If you cannot be joyful in a family of two, three people, with five thousand people you live, people will walk all over you every day. It's a much bigger challenge. I'm not saying ashram is the easy way out. If you succeed in your family, that you're happy, then come because now maybe you will do well with larger number of people. Otherwise, there's a huge issue. So this self-significance has come to you because you don't understand, you're just a small pop-up on this planet and you will pop out in no time. Hello? As you sit here, it's running away. What's ticking is not the clock, what's ticking away is your life. If you were conscious of it every moment, would you do one silly thing that doesn't matter to you? If you know time is running out, you would do only what really matters to you. If everybody here did only what genuinely matters to them, would we make a really wonderful world? Let's make it happen. <laughs> I think I'm going to end with this question and I, time permitting, we may take some questions but I don't really know but we're going to end with this question. You've answered a lot of questions over the decades of the external, of the outside world. What we want to know that who is Sadhguru? <laughs> that has to be the first longest silence, you know. Probably we make a record for that too now, you know. Oh, he's got a Guinness record now. <laughs> he got Sadhguru silent for a long time. It's for you to figure it out, right? Because uh, whatever I say will not make sense to you. <laughs> because what is really true, I can never say it. I can say a few simple things around it. One thing is, uh, it's very difficult for people to come to terms with. They, they think, oh, no Sadhguru, you're being humble, you're being this. People are even asking me, so many journalists, when you're writing for so long, what are you thinking? I said, why will I think anything? I don't think anything. On the right, I'm doing a lot of interviews and stuff, when I'm not doing those things, I'm not thinking anything, I'm just writing. This is why I'm grasping everything that's around me. Because you have received European education, where they thought thinking is a great virtue, <laughs> because they were not allowed to think by dogmatic religions for a long time, they made thinking a great thing. What can you think, tell me? You can only recycle what is already there in the data box of your head, isn't it? Can you think something that is not at all there in you? You can make permutations and combinations and that nonsense, now your phone does better than you. So that's why you call your companion smart, because you refer to somebody as smart only when they're smarter than you, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? So if your phone is smart, you're admitting something, it's all right it, by default, but it's okay. I'm saying you cannot think anything except what you already know. Mix it and match it. 
many masalas you can make, but it's the same stuff. That means if you're a thinking person, you have made sure nothing new ever happens to you. This in yogic culture we call it karma, a karma means one who is trapped in their own cycles, no new possibility, they're karmic. So, I got nothing in my head. I'm just like an empty space most of the time. So because of this, a thousand issues a day if I handle different varieties, there's nothing remains with me. Not that I cannot pull it back, I can, but I don't carry it on my head. I don't carry anything on my head. My… this large organization, we are running a global movement, we are running not just Save Soil, many, many other things we are doing. Over seventeen million volunteers trying to do… doing their best to drive me crazy. They will die disappointed because they cannot drive me crazy. Because only if you have a mind, you can become a mental case when you don't have. You're in short, totally. So, this whole process of what you're referring to as Sadhguru is not an enormous bundle of knowledge as people think it is. This is an empty space. So because of that, anything can come, anything can go. In this culture, that ultimate empty space, we called it she wa means that which is not. Just to make myself look substantial, I, I wear a turban so that people don't think I don't have anything in my head. <laughs> Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the end of this fabulous evening and we would like to thank the man on the mission. Let's give it up for him, ladies and gentlemen, who's making it all possible, inspiring millions. I think we can do better than that. Come on. I think we can really do better than that. No, no, no. Let's give it up for the man who's done 30,000 kilometers for us, for this world to be a better place. And let's together say today, we can and we will. If, uh... All of them, uh, uh, I want you to understand, uh, this is not my mission. If it is not yours, you will be a disaster and you will make it a disaster for everybody. As a generation of people, if we don't take this up, this will not work. One person, ten people, million people, not going to work. As a generation, we have to take this responsibility. Fortunately, we have democratic process in the world that you have the power to influence the government. You don't have to be somebody to do that, you could be anybody and still do that. So, Save Soil, let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. It's okay, no? Please. Mm -hmm. Are you… Are you… the mic's on or… Yeah. Well, I'll make… I'll make it least torturous. Uh, the man who's on the mission… mission for the soil, what can we… what can we give? What can we do? So what we've done as people of Mewar, as the people of Udaipur, we put the soil of Haldi Ghati together for you to take as a… as a remembrance, as a memento from our part of the world, hopefully which will keep inspiring you to do better and greater things. I like the size of it because I'm on a motorcycle. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because uh, wherever I go, people are bringing all kinds of gifts. I'm telling them next time I'll come with a truck, this time I'm on a motorcycle. Yes. This is good. I can take this. <laughs> Thank you.